kids are getting pretty wild in there, man. Is that safe? Yeah, they're fine. I've got their keys. Hey, have a beer, man. You deserve it. It's not worth it. Underage drinking risks everything you're working for. All right. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Great. Awesome. That's what we love to hear. This is quite a big crowd with some new faces. So on behalf of Safe Streets and Freedom Now, we'd like to rec um, welcome you to our coalition meeting. We are super excited about this meeting. As you can tell, we have an important battle ahead of us. And in looking at not only human trafficking, we believe it's important to look at what we're doing as a community, too, and other aspects regarding crime and crime prevention. Um, my name is Christy Pankratz, and I'm the director of Safe Streets. We have several staff around, so if you have any questions about anything, please feel free um, to visit with us afterwards. So I'd like to welcome all the visitors here and all of the people who've been coming on a regular basis. As you know, one of the things that we believe in doing is what, recognizing people who have done good things in our community. Because we talk a lot of times about all the problems that are going on, and we believe it's important to focus on the good. So we'd like to recognize our champion of character um, for August. I'd like to invite Chief Cochran and Sheriff Jones to come forward to recognize our champion of character. You'll grab. <laughs> come on, Sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to ask Officer Matt Blasingame to come forward. Matt, there he is. Let's give him a round of applause as well. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sheriff, would you like to read this? No, I'd like to. Seriously, can I see that? <laughs> that is little pretty <laughs> Well, on behalf of the chief here, uh, since I'm wearing my glasses, uh, we're here always to recognize those that excel in our community. Uh, there are those that excel that wear the badge and those that don't, but particularly this day, we have an individual of our Topeka's finest. And for that then, we, we, we give this recognition. And, and that Kansas chapter recognition, uh, character recognition council of Topeka, Shawnee County, recognizes Matt Blassingame. As the strength of our nation is dependent upon the health and, strength, as, and safety of its communities, the strength of our community is dependent upon the character of its citizens. Topeka City of, City of Character and Safe Streets Coalition of Topeka and Shawnee County recognizes Officer Matt Blassingame. Officer Massing, excuse me, Matt Blassingame came upon a car where he found an unconscious man. He tapped on the door on the driver's window loudly with his flashlight several times to no avail of a response. He broke the window, realized the man was having a medical emergency. He noted that the man had shallow respiration and a pulse. AMR arrives and his thank you very much. AMR arrived and his blood sugar was very low. After the man was taken to the hospital, Matt pulled available video footage and saw that this man had been sitting in the hot car with the windows up for three hours. From that, Matt has demonstrated initiative making Matt Blessingame a champion of character. And for that, we award you recognition. Thank, Thank you. you. only fitting that he say a few words. <laughs> well, I give presentations to children all the time, and one of the things that, they, uh, that they're most interested in is the, the tools on our 
our bat belts or our uh, tool belts that we have here. And normally when I give those presentations, uh, one of the things that I talk about is my expandable baton. And uh, up until this incident, I'd never used my expandable baton at work. So now I can, uh, I can explain to the kids that uh, I, I have used that. So um, I thank you very much uh, for this. I, I don't think I was doing anything different than um, any of the other law enforcement officers in this room would have done that day. Um, but I appreciate the recognition and thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Um, a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, we need approval of June's Safe Streets Coalition minutes. Do I hear a motion? Second? Awesome, thank you all very much. Um, a little bit of information from Safe Streets and what's going on. We have a few meetings that are coming up. Um, they involve different retail establishments as well as banking institutions. Um, in conjunction with the police department, we believe it's important to work together to connect what's going on in the community. If you have any interest in those, please see me afterwards and we'll get you on our listing. One of the big things that we have coming up is National Night Out. How many of you have heard a little bit about this? <laughs> Just a little bit? <laughs> All right. Well, this is the 35th year of National Night Out. In Topeka and Shawnee County, we believe in celebrating it in individual neighborhoods. As you can see by this little map, there are 85 neighborhoods currently signed up to participate. Um, and we're growing. I'm getting changes daily on this, which is awesome. So I encourage you to go to our website, safestreets.org, to check out and see the locations. You can pull up a Google map and see what's closest to you. Or you can also still have time to sign up for your own, which is what we really encourage people to do. Because this is not just a party, this is a way to connect with your community. So it's really important starting point moving forward. And additionally, we're working with Alpha Media and Hy-Vee to host a kickoff party the night before. Everybody is welcome. It's Friday, August 10th in the Hy-Vee parking lot. My goal is to see how many cars we can actually get in the Hy-Vee parking lot. I think, I think we can pass that. So encourage everyone to come out. Now it is time for some partner updates. I'd like to invite Sergeant Mike Burns with the Topeka Police Department to come forward. He is with their community policing unit on the east side of Topeka. Let's give him a round of applause. All right, for our uh, violent crime overall, uh, we did see an increase in homicide by two from uh, last month and an increase of uh, four to rapes, an increase of seven to uh, business robberies. Uh, the department's working very hard uh, currently to uh, attack these problems and these increases from last month. Uh, we did have uh, robbery individuals, aggravated assault and batteries go down. Um, and as you can see all the way to the right though, uh, for the most part um, from this time last year, violent crime is down. Um, the department, again, is working very hard to uh, get these numbers uh, as low as possible. Um, for the uh, city overall property crimes, um, a couple things, auto thefts uh, did go up as well as uh, vehicle break-ins. Again, we want to encourage residents, um, community members, um, and visitors to our great city that uh, Definitely lock up your valuables, don't leave it in plain sight, uh, make it so uh, the bad individuals in town don't know there's anything valuable in your cars. Um, and then at the bottom, uh, or close to the bottom, you'll see theft of license plates. Uh, in case you didn't know, we do have anti-theft screws at uh, the East Community Office at uh, Deer Creek, the West CPO Office, as well as the police station. Um, if you need assistance at all, getting those installed, feel free to contact your local community officer. I had Officer Parrott go to Central Park uh, yesterday to help an elderly woman install those anti-theft screws on their license plates. That way, we're deterring the criminals from getting tags, putting it on another vehicle that they may potentially then go commit another crime, and it makes it a little more difficult for us um, to investigate those crimes. So if you do have any um, any needs for those or assistance needed, contact your local community officer. We'll be more than happy to uh, get those. And then at some point, my request is that we're gonna have them also 
uh, in our uh, police kiosk that was uh, partnered with Cap Fed at 723 Southeast Quincy. And that way you can go downtown as well to get those. Um, we had the back to school event at Rebound Physical, which is at 17 Farallon. A little scary that it's already back to school time, in my opinion. Years definitely flying by. Um, great event. Kids were excited. Um, and uh, we, had a, we had a good turnout. Uh, upcoming events, as Christy stated, we're going to be at Hy-Vee for the kickoff. Um, you're going to see us out and about definitely on Saturday. Um, but we also have a Coffee with a Cop event September 11th at the uh, McDonald's that's being uh, refitted, rebuilt at 2-1 and Bell. Um, so if you want to come out, have uh, coffee with us, um, ask us any sort of questions you want. That event will be September 11th from 5.30 to 7. Uh, touch a little bit on the PAL. I think uh, big credit goes to the chief and the sheriff for partnering together and making this event bigger. Um, when I got involved with this uh, this year, the idea and the vision was to bring it back to what the PAL League used to be. Uh, the chief definitely has a, a big vision in that, a continuing to give back to the community. Um, and there is some new league information coming out. Uh, it's going to be a five-on-five -five format. Um, age divisions uh, have been added. Added. All the games are going to be played at the Nellis Field, located at the Boys and Girls Club at Two Seven and Adams. If you didn't know, creating a beautiful new uh, football field out there. And what we want to do is make sure that every inch of that football field is being used for the kids to have fun, get out there, play, and interact with everybody. Um, there's going to be six regular games uh, along with a postseason tournament. Um, and then uh, Officer Tim Bell's working with, um, going to be working with referees and other uh, older boys in the neighborhood to become referees. Again, a chance to be able to give back to uh, the kids and the youth in our environment. Um, and the big thing to register your team, uh, you're looking at uh, $15 per player, $90 per team. The chief definitely wanted to get as many kids available. Um, in the past, the registration had been a little higher. Uh, the chief wanted to knock that down, do more fundraising. The community has been great assisting us and donating what we needed. Um, but again, it's all about the kids. So we wanted to get as much participation from the entire city into this PAL League. And I think the vision is going to continue not just for football, but we're going to want to get other major sports continuing. So uh, again, uh, the chief, Cochran, uh, Sheriff Jones, they have partnered with this. They definitely are taking it on and wanting to expand it to what it once was. And I believe they deserve a round of applause for that. Thank you very much, Sergeant. All right, now we have a quick update from the Sheriff's Office, and the Sheriff just took a bite of a sandwich. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Let's give him a round of applause as he comes forward, all right? <laughs> Here you go, sir. I guess it's better than having a foot in your mouth, right? <clears throat> no, um, actually, uh, I, I want to uh, just dovetail right into what we're talking about, the programs that, that are available to our youth and our community. Uh, obviously, with, with the chief and myself, we really feel that it's very important that we invest in our youth because that is our future. And on both sides uh, of the aisle there, we have various programs. We just finished up with our youth programs that we had. We have. Uh, various programs such as uh, various youth programs that have gone on through the community. We start out at uh, Seaman and we have just an overabundance of, of youth that come in and we have a, a week long youth program where our deputies are involved with that, engaged with that, but more importantly we talk about not just about law enforcement but about being good citizens, good youth and, and making good choices about what's going on in their, in their surrounding. But we do three schools. One is uh, Seaman, the other one is Shawnee Heights, and because the program has expanded so much, we are now at Washburn Rule. And uh, each time that we finish up with that, the kids are, are ready to sign up for the next year. 
and we, we go from the, basically a little before they go to high school, but as the latter part of grade school, that's the age limit that we're looking at. And even beyond that, we were working with the boys and girls clubs, where we do a, a very uh, similar, a smaller condensed mini camp with our youth uh, uh, and the boys club. Now, I know PD works with that, and so it's really, it's, it's great to have that, that, that uh, joint uh, working group with the uh, Boys and Girls Club there, but we've managed to do um, the uh, youth club down in Monterra, which is a very good program that we have out there. So uh, that's just one of the items that we have that we have uh, during the summer. But as we move on into the school year, we start talking about other very various programs and, and what have you there. So it is about working towards our future so much uh, and of the present august the 11th is about our present it is about our neighborhoods and making them safe i cannot say enough how important it is about getting involved in your neighborhoods national night out is so important about us in this room and and i would even say and challenge you not only in your neighborhood but even in this room if you see someone you don't know, introduce yourself. This is an element where we can network to make our community much safer than what it is right now. Get uncomfortable so you can get comfortable with people that you don't know, and that becomes an ally for you of our safe streets there. So of that then, I just thank you for the everybody being here, but also back to you there, Christy. Thank you very much, Sheriff. Greatly appreciate that. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause, too. <laughs> All right, now it's my pleasure to introduce Barry Feeker with the Topeka Rescue Mission and Freedom Now, who's gonna make some remarks and introduce our special guest. Barry? Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you all for being here. Apologize for the air conditioning or lack thereof today and uh, packed in here, but uh, we have a very special speaker today. We have a very special reason for being here. Uh, after the Kansas legislature, City of Topeka and Shawnee County declared war on human trafficking, uh, in our state and uh, in our community. Uh, Kansas Attorney General Derek Schmidt said this, now it's time for the heavy lifting. Uh, this is the heavy lifting. Uh, what we have seen by your presence, not only here today, but so many of you who have been working tirelessly on this to be able to help us get to the place where we are uh, is a true example of what that heavy lifting really is about and what we're gonna be doing in the future. Because we're talking not just about addressing an issue for awareness, we're talking about eradicating an atrocity in our community. And that is heavy lifting. When we were processing through how we were going to do this, uh, we were looking at the local experts, which we have many in our community on this. Law enforcement people have been on the front lines of human trafficking for decades. Tapping into those resources, bringing us together, and that's, again, part of what we're doing here. But we also said we might want to look beyond ourselves. And so in doing so, we came across an individual by the name of Christine Dolan. I'm going to read just a little bit about her bio, which uh, it goes on for a very, very long time as far as uh, the information. Uh, but I want you to know this about Christine. She is a veteran broadcaster and print journalist, investigative journalist, television producer, photographer, author, author co-founder of American Conversations, and the former political director of CNN. During her career, Christine has covered three wars and most recently investigated human trafficking across the globe for over the last 18 years. Her colleagues call her the expert of experts on human trafficking. In 2001, her first human trafficking report, Shattered Innocence, the, millennial, the Millennium Holocaust, was released at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., where it is fully endorsed by her media colleagues the head of Interpol Trafficking Committee, and the former Deputy Attorney General of the United States Department of Justice. Since then, she has received numerous accolades. Christine leads investigations not only focused on the victims, the traffickers, those falsely accused of trafficking, and those who claim to fight trafficking, but the overall transcriminal and transnational nature of human trafficking from the local mafia to the international terrorist networks. Her body of work has been acclaimed for its groundbreaking analysis by world leaders, international law enforcement, and intelligence agencies. She has collaborated with them and addressed thousands of business leaders internationally. 
In June of 2014, with her European colleagues, Christine launched the first Hope for Healing retreat model for child abuse and human trafficking survivors in the U.S. A retreat model evolved since then, since they first launched in Europe in 2001. Christine and her colleagues are committed to transforming the global fight against human trafficking with a clear vision of shifting our paradigm on what needs to be done to reduce the increase in the population of trafficked victims on the street, over the internet, with tailor-made models to address the scourge locally. I asked Christine when we were talking months ago, I said, why are you interested in Topeka, Kansas, when you've done all of this? And she said, you all have a system that is developing that can win, that can win. And she said, I want to be a part of that. Introduce someone who is not just here for a meeting today, but plans to go the distance with us until we win. Please welcome Christine Dolan. when I was commissioned by the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. That is the grand, do I have to stay behind these mics, I guess? That is the grandson of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And for those of you that don't, that's the milk cart, Missing Kids. Um, in the 1980s, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children became an entity about missing kids in America. In 1998, they opened up the International Center, and their focus was on international parental abductions. And the night they had the opening at the British Embassy, I said to the CEO, you should see what happens in war zones, because people go missing. At that point, I had covered three, three wars. And for the military here, everybody knows that people go missing in war zones, before, during, and after. So the following year, I received a phone call, and I was asked if I wanted to investigate the exploitation of children emanating from the Balkan crisis that I had covered in the early 90s. I said yes, but there were two caveats. One, they had no say in the investigation, because I had been trained as a cr criminal investigator, and I had also led some big investigations at the networks. Two, they had no say editorially. The facts were the facts. I wasn't a gun for hire. So I spent the summer of 2000 crisscrossing Western Eastern Europe going back to the Balkans. And I interviewed a lot of law enforcement, and I want to acknowledge law enforcement in this room and ask you to stand up with the military, because you guys are on the front lines. And I want you all to understand this. You guys, you guys too. It is very important for your community to understand what the front lines do, and that includes Dustin, who's part of the prosecutorial team here locally. It is very important for people to understand the role of police in terms of protecting children. But the first role of a community is for parents and grandparents and superintendents of schools and teachers and community leaders like yourselves, you're obviously engaged or you wouldn't be here. I commend you all because this model that Barry is creating with his colleagues is extraordinary. And the reason why it's extraordinary is because for almost the last two decades, the models that have been in play do not work. There's a rise. Because a lot of times, the political agendas get in the way. People want to say, we want to do it this way. Or they're an NGO with a certain narrative. And I'm critical of NGOs because, like the police and like the military and the intel that I work with all over the world, we do go undercover. We try to find out what are the facts, what are the prosecutorials, what are the statutes. Do the statutes mirror the actual crimes? And in 2000, when I went undercover and hung out in red light districts, dressed up as a hooker with transvestites, who wore victims of child rape, 
I came to understand how much we think we know in civilized world and how much we do not know about the dark side. I don't have to be a victim. I'm actually a non-victim. And what I tell people is non-victims need to get in the game and help the people who are victimized because, quite frankly, they're losing the war. So when Barry and I started to get to know one another, I said this model will work because everything that's been out there really doesn't work and people have to look inside their own communities. Within the anti-human trafficking arena, most people don't understand that right now, in, right now, in real time, there are people in the anti-trafficking arena that want to raise at least $1.5 billion in a global fund, $250 million from the United States, 500 million from foreign governments, and 750 million from private foundations and wealthy people. And somehow we're going to have this global fund dictate how people should take care of their countries to reduce human trafficking. The problem is it's not going to work. The global fund leadership has been saying that the, it should be modeled after the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. The people that I work with actually were the inside, and they looked at the financials of the global ATM, as we call it. Just like we looked at the, the, the Clinton Foundation, and I don't mean that getting political, I can name the UN as well. The people throw money at this instead of inspiring people. And they throw money at it, and they think the bigger, we're, the bigger we have this, the more that we're actually doing. But the effectiveness comes from the downhill. It comes from the community level. It comes from waking up people and making them conscious of what they have in their communities first. I can tell you, having traveled all over the world and led these investigations, there is no one model of what this looks like. There is a market. Think economic markets. There may be a market for boys on one side. There may be a market for girls on the other side. And historically, it makes sense if you understand the history of slavery. I've had the value of the last 18 years being able to dive deep because I've heard too many people misquote history. I hear people say that slavery ended. No, it didn't. It just morphed into another model. I've heard people praise Wilberforce, who is a hero to me, but the truth is Wilberforce and his colleagues in the 1700s and the 1800s were focused on the African slave trade. And there were more people being sold as slaves to Arab countries than came across the Atlantic. I've heard people in this arena, when I asked them the question, do you even know where the word trafficking come, came from? We passed a bill in the U.S. Competition. <clears throat> we passed a bill in the U.S. in 2000. The anti, it's an anti-trafficking bill that's been reauthorized for the last years. The problem is this, that when they created this bill, they created it for sex and labor. They called it anti-trafficking. And having worked at four networks, I asked people, how did you come up with anti-trafficking? And I never got a straight answer. So I did my own deep dive historically. And here are the facts. We praised the abolition of slavery in the British Empire in 1807 and 1833. We praised Granville, Sharp, Wilberforce, Clarkson, Pitt, the people of their day. Yet there was a journalist in 1885 who was the publisher of the Pall Mall Gazette who basically told people, don't read our paper for the next four days because you may get disgusted. And they ran a series of young girls, virgins, being raped in aristocratic homes in England in soundproof rooms. That's how the term trafficking was created. So while Wilberforce and everybody in the abolitionists were focused on the African slave trade, which is really labor, sex trafficking in the late 1800s refer referred to girls and women being sex trafficked. It continued in the first century of the 20th century in the United States, the first decade of the 20th century in the United States, in New York. They found in the immigrants and tenant 
communities in New York City that there was trafficking that was going on. When businessmen say to me that they don't want to get involved, I say, why not? J.D. Rockefeller Jr. was appointed to a grand jury in 1906 in New York about the sex trafficking in New York. Their lights go on. They think, wow, maybe there's a place for me to get involved, all right? And when you take a look at this arena, know that when the League of Nations was set up, the League of Nations had two committees. One was on labor slavery and one was on trafficking. Fast forward to the 21st century, we have combined both, the labor and the sex. You will hear from many NGOs that they will talk about the fact that uh, this just involves sex and labor, as if the internet is not the elephant in the room. In 2000, I dined with mafia and traffickers. I asked them what their tools of the trade were. I went back to law enforcement who were educating me, bringing me on the inside, showing me the depth of depravity at the Hague Porn Unit and other units all over Europe, and I said to them, you guys need to be married on the street to the cops on the street because the internet is the elephant in the room. As this anti-trafficking fight has evolved, it took a long period of time, even for State Department, where our trafficking in persons office is, to even acknowledge that the internet was the elephant in the room. They finally have. But at the same time, most people in most communities do not get the connection of the dots. They don't understand how this works in this age of digital slavery. They, if we stick to the sex and labor, you've got subcategories under each one. But if you understand that if I travel to Cambodia or Thailand or Costa Rica, and if I want to buy a child, we now call that sex tourism. I'm the predator that goes overseas to buy the child. In, in the 21st century, if you have a digital camera, and you've got a computer, I can take a picture of that rape and put it on the internet, and that's called child porn across the world because that's the terminology that we use in our laws. I call it internet pedo criminality because every image that you see of a child being raped on the internet is not porn. It is a crime scene. It is used as evidence for prosecutions and for convictions and incarcerations. We have what we call organ trafficking. A couple of you guys told me you were in Afghanistan. One of my guys, who's a journalist from the UK, found a skin trafficking warehouse in Afghanistan because there's a lot of torture that goes on in war zones. We also know of cases from West Africa and East Africa where there have been body parts that have been sold. So you have skin trafficking, you have organ trafficking, you have a black market. Your kidney has a different price if you're in Egypt or if you're in Greece. We know that kids are taken from the streets in Albania and, and turned into beggars on the streets in Greece, and they might have a missing part taken out of their body because they're drugged. We now know about ritual abuse torture. Think of it like cults, like-minded people that get together and abuse people. It's a horrific scene, it's ugly, but here's the most that I can tell you in terms of emphasizing what's important. Everybody wants to stay downstream, hit the tsunami, wait for the horror, respond to everything that's bad down here. What I say to people, and the reason why I'm in Topeka, is because I know that the vision that we're doing, we have to take care of people down here who are victims. But most importantly, because this can happen so fast in a flash, we have to focus on the prevention up here. We have to focus on waking up what this is, as bad as it is, as evil as it is, we have to talk about the prevention of the increase in the population down here. Because if we don't talk about this, if we don't talk about mental illness, if we don't talk about the connection of child rape, and most people in jail have been victims of child rape, and if you talk to most victims that have been sexually trafficked, they will talk about child rape. And over here, there are connections of the dots that lead you down here. If you're a child who runs away from home, your Child Advocacy Center people, I understand, are in the room. They know when their doors open. They know how many people, in fact, have gone through those doors. They know how many forensic interviews that have happened. They know 
know that some of them are sexually abused children, some of them are neglected, some of them get put into foster care, some of them run away from home. But at the age of eight or nine or 10 or 11, when you run away from home or you get put into foster care, your discernment is not physically, neurologically developed until you're 23 or 24. So if you're on the street, you're in a place that you're not familiar with, you can get in trouble because you don't know what's going on. You don't know the difference between a felony and a misdemeanor. You don't know the difference between that's not normal to be raped. There are cases and people that I've met along this way, a man named Mike Skinner. When I met Mike in 2002, Mike is now in his 60s. He's white. He grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. His mother would prepare him for anal sex with his th two brothers for his father. This went on for years. People knew something was going on in that house. Nobody stepped in. His two brothers committed suicide. Mike now plays a guitar up in New Hampshire and talks about this. And he gets morally outraged because too many women in this arena will say, this is men doing it to, to, to girls and to women. Yeah, there's a lot of numbers that prove that there are some men doing this too. But at the same time, there are women who are rapists. There are women who are traffickers. And the convictions are out there. It's not just the woman who's married to Mad Max who runs the brothel in the hills of Bosnia. There are women who are rapists. There are women who are traffickers. There's a famous case up in New York State where a woman from China was a lead trafficker for the victims here in the United States. We don't talk enough about healing. I am of the firm, firm conviction that we need to have a conversation about healing people on this end when they're younger. Because sometimes the anger can grow. And sometimes when the anger grows, people snap. And then they end up in the detention centers in Topeka. Yesterday I had the absolute honor to talk to some of the women over in the detention center. They've all been raped. I can go over to the men's side next week. The majority of those guys are going to be raped too. And the first time I went into the jails and I had this theory that we're not paying enough attention to child rape and the ramifications of child rape in society, I wept in the parking lot because I said, there for the grace of God go I. I could have been, depending upon whose family I was born into, what country I was born into, I could be a victim of that. So I, I commend you all for coming together. I commend you all for taking a look at this. I know that we had a training last week. I know that when one of, I was told that they wanted to know more about Kansas statistics, that's my job. I'm gonna teach you how to be awake in your community so you're able to gather information because if I give it to you, you're not gonna be part of the journey. <coughs> You'll just be, I'll just be reading it to you. I want to teach you how to wake up in your community, how you figure out what you have. You may not have the same landscape that St. Louis has, or Chicago has, or Paris has, because I've lived all over the world, and I know that when I do these deep dives, there's a cultural component to this. There's an age component to it. There's a religious component to it. There may be a ritualistic acceptance to it. And people have to understand, in order to get involved, in order to make a difference, you've got to take this journey. And that's why I commend Barry for what he's put together. And I commend all of you for coming together for this. Because it's going to be a little hard, and it's going to be tough for some people. But at the same time, I think that it's inspiring that the, the model that you're building from the community up is very different. There have been task force in the United States that have been set up. I'm a critic of the task force because I don't see what they're doing. I see people come in and say, oh, the cops aren't doing their job, or the prosecutors aren't doing that job, or the legislatures aren't doing that job, when in fact, it's got to come, this, you've got to have people inspired from the ground, and people will get this right. Now, you've got some laws here. The problem, the problem in the last 18 years in the United States with laws is we have a federal law with stiff penalties. 
And then now, all of a sudden, in the last years, we've had more laws. So we've got 50 laws. Some of them don't have stiff penalties. Some of their laws have to be incorporated into to their existing child rape laws in some states. Some states, it's a misdemeanor to traffic an adult. And nobody, everybody's all over the pages. You need to have stiff penalties. I read a case yesterday from Dustin and Mike Kagan when this isn't a trafficking case, but it's on its way because this is a father who got what, Dustin, 50 years? 50 years, and it was his own children. And what came out late in the case was taking pictures, okay? Here's how it works. And there are clubs for this. There's a famous guy named Gary Salt who's in the UK. He used to rape his kids, what we call live stream, with audiences taking instructions. And then some of these perverts from other countries would go to London to have their picture taken with his kids as if it was a Christmas card. Now, as abhorrent as that may be to all of you in this room to hear something like that, that's not necessarily unusual for people who are in the pedo trafficking business because they look at it as a souvenir. In most cases, and law enforcement can attest to this for those that have worked on this, a lot of times when you bust a pedophile, it's not just one person. He's related to other people. You may have a custody case where the mother sounds like she's crazy because she's accusing the father of being a pedophile. But in fact, on the weekends, I've interviewed kids who are under the age of 10 who have been victimized because they've been passed around by the pedophile fathers to his friends. Sometimes you have to educate the judges so the judges know this isn't a wild custody accusation. It may, in fact, be the real thing. For those ministers who are in the room, you have a captivated audience on Sunday. Bless your hearts, because you have a role in this as well. A lot of people say, well, you know, you don't want to make it faith-based. I say, yes, you do, because here's the reason why. It's very logical. You can get the shrinks, you can get the doctors, you can get the nurses in the room. But when it's all over with, and I've interviewed too many victims, they can't get rid of the memories. The notion of forgiveness is huge spiritually, and I've heard that over and over again. I'm not talented for that. A nurse may not be talented for that. A doctor may not be talented for that. The judge may not be. But the people who really are solidly in the soul game, as I call it, they know the power of prayer. And if it can happen in Rwanda, it can happen within the trafficking arena. So when I talk to people about shifting the paradigm, shifting the conversation, I think that what you have here is a jewel that can shine and that you, if you get this right, and I do believe that you will, not just because of Barry and Amber and Jenny and the rest of his team, Terry, I think because I've spoken to so many of you that are the sector leaders and the vice chairs. If I didn't believe in you, I wouldn't waste my time because I'm about shifting the paradigm. I'm about cracking open the conversation with people. I'm about telling people that what's working is not working. I'm about telling donors, if you're going to give money to an organization that's in the anti-trafficking arena, then you better make certain, because you've got a stewardship responsibility to it, to see that, in fact, the model is for the reduction of the victims. You have to take care of them for those that exist, but you also need to focus on creating a model that does not increase and perpetuate. If not, then we're all going to be in the business of taking care of victims. And I think that we're better than that. I think that we can start this conversation and start it in Topeka and help, and I'm here to help you guys. I told Barry yesterday that I had a shift 
um, and I was going to stay here till August 10th. I'm going to stay here longer because I want to sit down with, after we do the training, sit down with all the sector leaders. I'm not just going to give you some questions you might want to figure out to ask in your different sector leadership, but I'm going to really sit down and hone in on how to get you guys going so you're rocking and rolling. We've talked about me coming back in November, and in November, what's going to be kind of neat is we'll have a different type of conversation because you're going to be participating in that with your teammates about what is it that you find. Think of it as a blank piece of canvas at this time. Go into it with no judgments, just focus on the facts. And by November, we'll be throwing some paint up so that the other sector leaders will understand what the landscape looks here. At that point, you're going to go back in. And we're going to stay with this until you get it right. And then you have to take a look at what could be the practical solutions in this community to really reduce this. We know that homelessness and poverty and wars have been part of the conversation since before we were all born. I've been hearing about the hunger project since I was a teenager. I sold my parents' car before I had a license when we landed on the moon because I was objecting to the fact we were going to the moon because there were people starving in Biafra. We keep on hearing about the war on poverty helping the homeless. We don't talk about the root causes. We don't talk about the hurt that might lead somebody to those vulnerable positions in society. We don't talk about the mental illness. We don't talk about a country that is over-medicated but is also hurting. We don't talk about the statistics, one in five girls, one in six boys, or one in 10 boys under the age of 18 in America have been raped. Doctors know that when kids come in and they've got gonorrhea of the mouth, something's going on. Medical doctors will take a look at the girls and examine them and say something's going on. We have laws that say you need to report this to the police. We also had state legislatures prior to the Catholic investigation that said you didn't have to report if you were part of the Catholic Church. That's in my home state of Massachusetts. The state legislator passed laws that the priests didn't have to be reported to the police. The systems don't work. The institutions don't work. People worry about their brand. They worry about, is it going to hurt me? And even within this arena, when you think that people are in it for the right reasons, there's a report that came out in the UK that talks about Oxfam, Save the Children, the Red Cross, having people within their ranks of exchanging food for sex. And this is in the charity business. It's no different than the UN. You hear stories about UN peacekeeping forces giving food away in exchange for sex all over the world. So we have a self-examination that has to happen, not just within our own souls, but within the communities that we belong to. After I did my first investigation, I decided to take on the Catholic Church. That's my heritage. So if anybody's Catholic in here, don't get upset. I'm from Boston. That's what we do. We get into politics before we're baptized. But when Boston was imploding, I took off my journalistic hat and I met with the prosecutors in O'Reilly's office. And I said to them at the time, stop trying to work out a deal with the diocesan defense attorneys who are using canon law as an excuse. I said, go in there with your search warrants and remove the historical secret archives. Nobody understood what I was talking about. And I said, within each diocese, they have historical secret archives that say, I, Father, so-and-so, under the vow of, in canon law, and obedience will stop raping little Jimmy, little Johnny. Those are the files, some of which were protected by the statute of limitations, and but for the prosecutors in Massachusetts and the, uh, the wonderful Const Judge Constance Sweeney, those documents were released to the public. And that's what gave you spotlight, the coverage by the Boston Globe, the coverage by the New York Times, and the floodgates of everybody saying, wow, what's going on here? 
But unfortunately, we live in a country that we don't have national inquiries. Australia, Ireland, England have national inquiries in the institutional response to child abuse. It started off as religious, it expanded to sports and education. My dream is to see you guys actually do the inquiry here in Topeka and also see if you can take, encourage people to take a look at their institutions. We have never done this in America to take a, take a real deep dive into the institutional response to child abuse because we know that there is a connection between child rape, the ramifications for kids, and what happens down here in the downstream. I think that what you have is special. I think it can start here in a different way that has an impact with a trajectory of influence beyond anything that you can possibly imagine. Because the way that it's being done now, we're not having the big effects we should have for the hundreds of millions of dollars that's being thrown at this issue. We need results. It's that simple. We need people to change the way that they look at these issues. We can't look at them and say, oh, these are other people over here. No, your kids are at risk today. Your grandchildren are at risk today. Because the average age of looking at porn is eight. And what they're looking at is not erotica. When I got into covering this, it was mostly erotica. Today it's not. It's bestiality and it's torture. And some of the stuff that I have seen when the cops educated me 18 years ago, the really bad stuff, if you think Abu Ghraib was bad, it's nothing. That's nothing compared to this. And this is what kids find. Xbox. How many people know what Xbox is? Okay, Xbox is a gaming tool. Kids go on, they think they're bonding with another 12-year-old. They get pulled into it. And what happens is they bond, then they get taken to porn sites. The conversations with kids need to start with, I'm your mommy, I'm your daddy, I'm your grandparents, you can always come to me. You give them rules to follow, they're gonna break them. We were all kids, we know what that means to, is to break a rule. You think you're, you think you're gonna be okay, you're invincible. The conversations with children today have to be about safety. They need to know that they can always go to mommy and daddy. They can always, if they get in, if somebody threatens them, if somebody says, I'm going to kill you, if somebody says, send me a picture, and they send a picture, and then it's a nasty picture, and then all of a sudden they want, they want a picture with some movement in it, and they get scared, and then they get threatened. Kids need to know that there's a place for them. And if they can't go to the parents, they need to be able to go to the teachers. And the teachers need to know that sometimes their schools are not necessarily safe. I've been in enough schools and talked to enough teachers to know that they think they've got the whistles and the bells and the kids don't know how to break the rules. The truth is, they're smarter than we are. This is their world. They grew up in technology. We need to shift this. And we need to start a conversation and you need to inspire your neighbors and educate your family because if it happens in your family, I guarantee you, I've done enough cases to know, your family will be forever changed. Your community will be forever changed. And people say, what's in your papers? What's in your community here in Kansas? Last weekend, I clipped out some of the stories that are out there. Your journalists are covering some of the stuff. They may not call it trafficking. They may not have all the tools to call it trafficking for a prosecution in Dustin and Mike's office. But the truth of the matter is, the information is out there and hopefully this journey will take you so that you are able to connect the dots. So when you hear something, you say, oh, I wonder if, ah, this kid doesn't look like this kid's happy anymore, but this kid was happy two months ago. Or you walk down the street and you don't pass that homeless person who's weeping. You ask them what's going on. And the next time that the guys go to the strip clubs here, here's my message for those who watch pornography and those that go to the strip clubs here. Ask yourself, how do you know that that pole dancer's there on their own? 
How do you know what really happens when you're watching pornography beyond the prism of that camera boundaries? How do you know that that person wants to be engaged in this? Because sometimes they don't. If you ask most of the victims, as I said to Brian's clients and Hannah's clients yesterday, how many of you want to be here in the detention center? They don't want to come back, but they don't know how to not come back because they have to break some of the chains. So what I see is your leadership in terms of breaking the chains for the people that are hurting in your community and saving your kids and reducing the population on this end, but still taking care of people down here as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. Christine, thank you uh, so much. Uh, questions abound. Uh, we would like to have time for questions, but we want to get some time for our sector groups to be able to get together today. So uh, we'll be here afterwards when we're done to possibly ask Christine some questions. Uh, as I said, Christine's not here to just give a speech. She is here to join us on this journey. She's already worked with the sector leaders and the vice leaders, vice chairs of this. She is going to continue working with Freedom Now USA and what we're doing in this community for the long haul. And so if you've been stirred, if you've been troubled, uh, join the crowd. Uh, this is not pleasant news. This is not stuff we like to talk about. This is not feeding a bunch of hungry people and sheltering the homeless. This is deep. This is hurtful. This is painful. But if we're going to help our community and our state and our nation be what it should be, we've got to do what we've got to do. And so thank you for being here. Now, if you are sector uh, teams, you can go to your tables. If you're not on a sector, if you would uh, go to the front table out here so that you can check in. Um, and then uh, we will uh, be done for today. City 4, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Uh, this concludes the Safe Streets meeting.